Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that. All right. Let's get into the deets and talk about the lady of the hour. So we are so fortunate to have Amy Lenniker with us. Amy Lenniker is an optimistic, joy-seeking, recovering workaholic. She is also a leadership consultant, a certified Dare to Lead facilitator, and a self-proclaimed public service nerd. Amy spent over 20 years working for the state of Washington in six cabinet agencies and the legislature. While working for the state, Amy earned her bachelor's and her master's of public administration with a focus on public policy and leadership development. She is a first-generation college student and is the happiest when she is learning and laughing alongside others. Amy and her husband have two wonderful kiddos, two wacky dogs, and zero guinea pigs, despite her daughter's compelling PowerPoint on why they couldn't live without one. They make their home in the Pacific Northwest, and drum roll, please, without any further ado, the mic is yours, Amy. Great. Thank you. I always love a good drum roll. <laughs> so thank you for that. I wanted to start with some thank yous. Thank you to the Results Washington team. Thank you to everyone who is here. As you just heard, I spent over two decades working in state government. And if there was one thing I didn't hear enough, it was thank you. So thank you for what you do on behalf of the hundreds, if not thousands of people that you help every day. Today, we are going to look at how can we approve, improve work-life harmony. And what's gonna be different about this presentation is that we are not talking about work-life balance. If you have been trying to achieve work-life balance and you feel exhausted or stressed or like a complete failure, you're not alone. Work-life balance is unattainable. We're gonna look at work-life harmony which is attainable. And we're not just gonna focus on ourselves. Lots of books, lots of presentations talk about what can I do to achieve work-life harmony for me. And what I think they're missing is that we all have a piece of helping other people achieve their work-life harmony too. So that's our goal. You are gonna leave here in one hour with some tools and strategies that you can use right away to not only make your own work-life harmony better, but to make others better too. If you've been in a training of mine before, and so many of you have, because I was watching the names uh, come by and I recognize so many of you. So welcome back. Uh, if this is the first time we're working together, I hope it's the first of many times we get to work together. And we're going to start today with a two-word check-in. This is a, a tool that Brene Brown uses when she begins every facilitation. It's now a tool that I use when I begin every facilitation. So do me a favor and type into chat, what are two words to describe how you're doing today? And if you're thinking, I have no idea, uh, you can look on page three. In page three of your workbook, I've given you something called the feeling wheel. Many times when we describe how we're feeling, we don't actually use feeling words. So that tool can help you there on page three. So look at all of these that are coming in. And what's happening right now in chat is what happens every single time I do this two-word check-in. The two-word check-in is important for two reasons, and I hope you start doing it in your own meeting too, because what the two-word check-in can do is it can drive connection, and it does that in two ways. The first thing is it makes us connect to ourselves. What am I bringing into this room right now? How am I feeling as this webinar starts? Many times, especially if you're in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back team meetings all day long, you may not ever take a moment to say, how am I? What am I bringing into this space? So the first thing it does is that moment of self-awareness where we connect to ourselves. The second thing it does is it gives us a moment to recognize that we are not all having the same experience. If you look in chat, we have some folks who've said excited, hopeful, looking forward to it. And there's others who've said overwhelmed, sad. I saw someone mention grieving. I saw someone just mention annoyed, frustration. 
whether or not we name it, that's what we're bringing in. And so it gives us that moment of empathy to recognize that we're not all having the same experience. And when you do this as a smaller team, it also gives you a chance to know what are those opportunities for connection. To the person who trusted us enough to tell us that you were grieving, if I were your coworker, I would follow up with you on break. Hey, I saw that you're grieving. I'm here for you. How can I be helpful? It gives us that moment to drive connection in our workplaces. So it is only 11 minutes after we've started and you've already got your first tool. <laughs> Bring back the two we're checking, try it out and see what happens. Let's now look in your workbook on page four. Let's do a quick stress check because if we're gonna talk about work-life harmony, we're gonna have to appreciate and acknowledge that stress plays a role in it. If you look on page four of your workbook, you will see a Likert scale for stress. This is the one I use most often. There are hundreds of Likert scales on stress, but I use this one from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs because I think they get right what so many Likert scales have gotten wrong. You'll notice on this Likert scale, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs doesn't define bothersome. They allow each of us to define what bothersome means to us. After decades of working with veterans, what they know is that we could be going through something similar and you may not be bothered at all. Maybe we're on the same work team and you're thriving. You're doing great. And I am having challenges. I'm missing deadlines. I'm showing up late for work. I'm getting into conflict with people that I wouldn't normally get into conflict with. So I love this Likert scale because it doesn't define bothersome. It lets us do that. It also doesn't put a timestamp on it. It doesn't say how stressed out are you today or in the last week or the last month because they know that stress isn't always time bound. So what I'd love for you to do is type into chat on a scale of one to 10, where one is not bothered at all, 10 is incredibly bothered. How bothersome has your stress been? And if you're wondering, well, is she talking about work stress or is she talking about life stress? The answer is yes. It's another reason that I think uh, this is the best Likert scale on stress because the Department of Veterans Affairs, they don't ask us that. They don't talk about work versus home because what they recognize is that our stress goes with us wherever we go. And how we're doing at home impacts how we're doing at work. How we're doing at work impacts how we're doing at home. This old compartmentalized way of thinking is just not real. We take ourselves wherever we go. If you look in the chat, there has been a wide range of numbers. We have some of us here today who are at the lower end of the scale. I have seen more than a few that have come in as a 10. And those of you who are at the higher end of the scale, what I would share is that it's not easy being there. It's not easy to be a 10 or to sustain being a 10. And my hope for you is that today you can prioritize you. What is it gonna take to help you reduce some of the bothersomeness that stress is having for you right now? You may not realize it, but what you just did is one of the best practices of preventing burnout. How can that be? How could just sitting here, could we have already done one of the best practices of preventing burnout? And it's because according to the World Health Organization, burnout is what happens when we have chronic stress that hasn't been managed. It is just that simple and it's just that difficult. If you want to know how can I prevent, how can I reduce burnout in my workplace, it's by acknowledging the workplace stress. What is the, how bothersome am I right now by stressed? How is that holding me back? That's the first step and one of the best practices of preventing burnout. Each year, Gallup 
who is an industry leader in workplace research, they put out a state of the global workforce report. And you heard in the introduction that I'm a public service nerd. I'm also, I'm kind of a nerd in general. I, I live for this report <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. The minute it comes out, I read it cover to cover. Um, and it just came out recently. The 2024 report came out that includes data all through 2023. And one of the key findings is what you're looking at right now on your screen. According to Gallup, what they wrote is that people's mental well-being has been worsening. And in the last 10 years, the number of people that are feeling and expressing stress, sadness, anxiety, worry has been on the rise. And what was even more startling to me is the last piece of what you're looking at on this slide is that it has reached its highest levels since the Gallup surveys began. That is a really big deal. And if you're looking at this slide and you can relate to it, if you can say, yeah, I am feeling stress, sadness, anger, worry, know that you're not alone. You are not alone. This is shown in the data of the global workforce. If you're looking at this slide thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't feel sad, anxious, ang angry, or worried at all it's still important that you know this because even though you may not, it's very likely that the people around you are. And remember how we kicked this off. We're not just talking about work-life harmony for ourselves. We're talking about work-life harmony for each other. And so we've got to understand exactly what is the culture? What is the temperature right now? One other thing they showed us in that latest Gallup report is that stress has been rising over the last three decades to where now 49% of workers globally report having stress in the previous day. And if you're like me, you might have looked at this chart and wondered, well, what happened back in 2004? Well, Gallup wondered the same thing. So I dug a little deeper to find out. And in 2004, after they did their global workforce report, they dug into that. What happened in 2004? Why the drastic dip? And it turns out, if you look here at the headline on your screen, the top two contributing factors were work and children. <laughs> so kind of another way of talking about work-life harmony. So if you either work or have children or people that you care for, you are part of this group that experienced the highest levels of stress. The last thing I wanted to share from the Global Workforce Report is that last year they showed that while employee engagement stagnated, it didn't go down, which is a win in terms of employee engagement, overall well-being declined. And we have to recognize that for ourselves and each other, that according to them, the majority of the world's employees continue to struggle at work and in life, and that those have direct consequences on how productive, how effective we are in the workplace. So let's transition this then into work-life harmony. What role does work-life harmony have? How can we use some new tools and skills on work-life harmony to help us reduce how bothersome our stress is, to help us increase our well-being? Let's start with a definition. So in your workbook, I have for you on page five, one definition of work-life harmony. This one says that work-life harmony is when an individual is able to achieve both personal and professional goals in a combination that is uniquely satisfactory. It goes on to say that it differs across individuals because we have different needs, responsibilities, values, and priorities. This is the definition that I use when I'm working with organizations because it calls out the fact that work-life harmony is uniquely satisfactory. What work-life harmony means to me may be very different than what it means to you. And even if I have the best intentions and I'm trying to create a workplace, and I'm trying to create work ground rules that are going to help me with my work-life harmony, I may not even know that I'm actually making yours worse. 
So we have to recognize work-life harmony to define it is really for each one of us to say, well, what are my personal and professional goals? And what are the goals of the people around me? By the time you leave here today, I'm going to give you three questions that are going to guide you to finding an improved work-life harmony. And here's the first one. The first question is, what does work-life harmony look like for you in this season of life? The last part of this question, I believe, is the most important part. And it's what I think all the books that I've read, and I have read dozens, and all the TED Talks I have watched, and I have watched dozens on work-life balance, gets wrong. What's missing is the part about in this season of your life. So often we think about work-life harmony as something we've got to figure out now. I've got to know what it looks like now until the day I retire. And that's simply not true. That's not how work-life harmony works. What will be most helpful is if you start to change the way you think about work-life harmony to think about it in terms of seasons. Martha Beck is a writer and she talks about a season of your life is defined when you have a change in responsibilities and a change in schedule. Those are two of the big markers of a seasonal change. So as you think about your own life, where you are right now professionally, where you are right now personally, when you have a significant shift in your schedule, a significant shift in your responsibilities, that's a marker of a new season. And that's a marker to reevaluate what do I want work-life harmony to look like right now? My first job in state government was in 1996. Holy cow, how, how long ago was that? <laughs> so, so if I think back to my very first job in state government in 1996, all the way up to today in 2024, there have been a lot of different seasons in my life. And the way that I would define work-life harmony in one of those seasons is very different than the way I would define it in other seasons. It's part of why I believe I suffered for so long trying to figure out how to do this whole work-life balance thing. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but for me, whenever I was at work, I would feel guilty about all the things that I needed to be doing at home. And when I was at home, I would feel guilty about all the things I needed to be doing at work. And wherever I was, whatever I was doing, it never felt like enough. I never felt like enough. Shifting our perspective to work-life harmony, honing in on seasons can help. So let me show you just a few from my life. And I would encourage you to think about your own season map. What would yours look like? So back in 1996, when I first started with state government, I was in college. I was working for DSHS during the day. I was going to school at night. You heard in the intro that I'm a first generation college student, first person in my family to go to college, first person to go to graduate school, and trying to navigate all of that was a lot. And what work-life harmony meant for me at that first state job, it meant that I could leave work every day on time so I could drive to campus, park my car, and be in class ready at 6 p.m. when class started. That was the biggest piece of work-life harmony for me, was that I could get to school so that I could earn my degree. That season shifted in 2003 when I was pregnant with our first son. And I was sick all the time. I had something called hyperemesis, which is some fancy word that basically means you shall now vomit for the next nine months of your life. You will vomit all day, every day. That I think that's the translation. So what work-life harmony meant for me then when I was working at the legislature was that I had to be able to take care of myself. I had to be able to figure out, I mean, I'll never forget it. I was uh, staffing committees and I would have to sit in the chair closest to the door. <laughs> So they started reserving that chair for me so I could sit in a committee hearing and I could fly out uh, and make it to the bathroom if I needed to, uh, to throw up on time. 
Then it shifts. 2004, our son comes in the world, and now your season is different. And for those of you with littles at home, you are in a new season, and you're probably figuring out as you go, just like I did. There are some seasons that bring a lot of joy. The birth of a child is a, it's a wildly stressful but incredibly joyful season. And there are seasons that are really hard. You'll see up here on the slide in 2010 when my grandpa was getting ready to pass away. Work-life harmony to me meant that I could travel to the Midwest and I could be there for weeks at the end of his life with him. That was work-life harmony. And we won't go through all of these, but as you see these seasons of life, whether it's when I went back to Evergreen as an adjunct faculty and I had to make sure that I was there on time to teach my class or being with my grandma at the end of her life. And as you look into 2024, my daughter and I, we have a, a tradition where I take her to crumble cookie every Friday. So that's kind of our thing. And, and so work-life harmony means I don't take a meeting on Friday afternoon because that's our crumble cookie time at least as long as she'll have me. She's a teenager and all my friends say that's gonna end soon. <laughs> but I'm gonna take her to crumble every Friday for as long as she's willing to go. So I wanted to show you just that quick quick map for me of how seasons change. And that last photo that you're seeing with me uh, wearing a hoodie, it's really about balancing. When I facilitate, I love facilitating, I love training, and I'm a self-proclaimed introvert. So that photo you're looking at there with my hood up, I was spending the whole day researching conflict. I was knee deep in data. I could not have been happier. That's work-life harmony. Balancing what we're giving out versus what we're getting back. What's the amount of energy that I have to give and what is gonna help fill me up? So as you think about question one, what does work-life harmony look like for you in this season of your life? And not knowing is an okay answer. As I think back to all of those photos that you just looked at, I don't know if in that exact moment I could have articulated exactly what it meant for me, but it got clearer and clearer as I went on. In your workbook, let's do an exercise. Let's do an exercise together on page six. And this is a lean transformation conference. So let's use a lean philosophy to help us with work-life harmony. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to think about what portion of your life is work. And you're going to think about it from two perspectives. One is your current state. When you look at your current state of how you're spending your time, what portion of your life is work? Then you're going to think about your desired state. If you could design your life however you want it, if you could design it in a way that would bring you the most fulfillment, the most joy, what portion of your life would be work? As you're looking at these two circles, what's most important is the variance between them. Do you, your two circles kind of look the same? Are they just a little bit different? Or when you look at the two circles, do you say, there's a big gap here. There is a big discrepancy here. And when you're thinking about work, I just saw the question, great question, Heidi, does work include homework too? Yeah. Because if you're thinking about how much time are you devoting to your job, maybe you leave work, maybe you log off every day at 5 p.m. Your end time is 5 o'clock. But you do email in the evening or you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a work project. That's actually time that you're working. My entire time in state government, I was a salaried employee. And before my job with the state, I was on a time card. I would go to work, I would punch my time card, I would leave, I'd punch my time card again. So there was this really clear output of here's how much time on your time card that you've worked. Really different once you're a salaried employee. It can start to get a little more gray. It can start to be a little more nuanced. If you were to do this exercise in a room full of people, I would bet that no two circles would look the same. 
And I say that because I have done this with dozens of teams and no two circles have ever looked the same. They may look similar, but what it shows us is that our own interpretation of work-life harmony, what we want may look different. And so part of this work is removing any judgment that we have about ourselves or for each other. This isn't about judging ourselves. What should I want out of this life? What should my coworker want out of my life? Anytime we're using the word should, we're on a slippery slope to judgment. What we can do is replace that judgment with curiosity. Well, what would that look like? Why is that important to me? You can start to remove the judgment and then you can be curious and stay in the conversation. It's what leads us to question number two. I had promised you that you would leave with three questions. And question number two is what gets in the way? You've just been really clear. You drew out in a circle what your desired state is. What gets in the way? And I'm so grateful to all of the folks who were brave enough to put into the chat feature what your current is versus your desired state. Thank you for doing that. I think any time we have that kind of sharing, it just makes all of us better. And so if we think about what gets in the way, why am I not at my desired state? I wanted to share three things that I've seen. Uh, not being retired. <laughs> I just saw pop up in chat multiple times. Yes, that's a reality, isn't it? What gets in the way? Maybe there's a mortgage to pay or bills to pay or a kid to send through college. Those are real things. And again, it goes back to that season. So in this season of my life, what are my responsibilities versus what will those responsibilities be in a different season? So the three things that I've seen the most, not just in research and not just from working with teams, but also from my own life, the three things that I have seen get in the way the most are what you're looking at on the screen. So let's look at all three of these. Let's look at each one at a time. The first thing that can get in the way of our desired state of work-life harmony is the organizational culture that we're in. An organizational culture is simply the values, the expectations, the practices that guide and inform the team. That's the organizational culture. And you may be in an organization right now that supports work-life harmony. And I hope that's true. I hope you are. I hope you're in an organization that not only understands the importance of work-life harmony, but that deliberately puts practices into place to ensure that it's happening. And some of you may not be. Some of you may not be. Some of you may be in an organization that doesn't understand work-life harmony that is modeling either intentionally or unintentionally that you always have to be on, that you are responsible for looking at email any time of the day or every day of the week, or that when you go on vacation, it's not really a vacation. You're on vacation, but you're still expected to be on or whatever is happening. What organizational culture are you in? And does it align with your version of work-life harmony? And please know that what you do is so much more important than what you say. If you're in an organization that says we really value work-life harmony, we want to come to work and do a really good job, and we want people to have well-balanced lives. We don't want to fall into the gap or fall into the trap that we heard from Gallup where well-being has declined. We're an organization that really values well-being. If that's what you say, but then what you do is completely different. What's real, the practices, the way the organization works, the way it functions, maybe it rewards people who overwork. Maybe in your organization, stress is a badge of honor. The more stressed out you are, the harder you work, the busier you are, maybe that's what's rewarded. That's what people are gonna pay attention to. So it's not just what you say is your culture, it's what is actually your culture. So that's the first thing that can get in the way. 
And this is great because look at all of the examples in the chat feature who are giving examples of how this is happening in their organizations. Some are saying they've got full support. I just read another, my organization is flexible. I'm lucky to have a team that understands it. That's the thing. We all have choices about where we work. And it's important that we choose to be in an organizational culture that aligns with what we want out of our professional and our personal lives. The second thing that can get in the way are boundaries. A lack of really clear boundaries can get in the way of work-life harmony. If we use Brene Brown's definition, I love this because it's so simple. She writes about boundaries as simply what's okay and what's not okay. Those are your boundaries. And in an organization where boundaries are clear and they're respected, your well-being will be higher. Let's look at some of the boundaries that are most often not clear in organizations. One I see a lot is on communication. I am literally working with a half a dozen teams right now on creating communication guidelines of how and when and why the team is going to communicate together. What was happening for these six teams, and I don't know if it's happening for you, is that there are so many different channels of communication. There's email and there's teams and there's texting that what was happening is the team was just getting completely overwhelmed and things were getting missed. They would have an important assignment that dropped in Teams and someone didn't see it, or something went in email and then it got missed. The unfortunate thing is that the anecdote to that, the solution in, in quick thinking, was to then use all the channels for everything. So imagine how frustrating it was on that team when you would get an email, then you would hear the same thing in Teams, and then you would get a text telling you the exact same thing really frustrating. So we've got to have clear boundaries around communication. What channel do we use and when? What channel do we use and why? <laughs> Kelly, I agree. That is sometimes how those messages come <laughs> from the district. Yes, it's so true. The second is meetings. If I ruled the world, I would love to cut the number of meetings by about 90%. And that might seem drastic because a big part of my livelihood is facilitating meetings. <laughs> but how many of you type into the chat the word yes if you agree that we have too many meetings in organizations? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at the result. I think there might have been one no, but perhaps that was from a fellow facilitator. Look at all the yeses. We have too many meetings. What I'm seeing so often right now on Teams is that in the desire to not leave anyone out, they're over inviting people to meetings. And so a meeting that maybe could have been three or four people has 15 or 20 and meetings are expensive. They're expensive in terms of money. They're expensive in terms of time. They're expensive because every time we're in a meeting, we're not doing something else. So meetings should have a high bar. If we're going to come together in a meeting, the bar should be high. Do we know why we're meeting? Do we know why every single person is in that meeting? And if the answer is no, then we've got more work to do. The reason why I put this here in a presentation on work-life harmony is because, unfortunately, so many people are in meetings most of their day, which means after work is when they're doing email. Can anyone relate to that? You're in meetings all day long, and it isn't until the end of the day that you say, wow, okay, now I've got a day's worth of email to do. We've got to we've got to scale back the meetings. We've got to think about, it is not enough to just think about the workday from eight to five if what we have is people doing hours and hours of email outside of that. How do we start to scale that back into something that's really attainable? The third boundary is availability. What does it mean to be available in your organization? Are you on call all of the time? 
And some of you might be, some of you may be in a line of work where yes, you are in fact on call. For many of you, maybe that's not the case, but the culture has created an environment that feels like an on-call environment. Are you available all the time? And what does that mean? If one person on the team is always available and they're rewarded for that, they're constantly complimented on how they're always available, that is shaping the culture of your organization. It is shaping the culture that says, here's what it means to work here. Here's what it means to be successful here. Uh, the fourth boundary I'd love for you to think about is deadlines. And so often organizations call things urgent that really aren't urgent. I'm a huge fan of the Eisenhower matrix, this idea that we've got to think about what's urgent, what's important. Everything cannot be urgent. It simply can't. Because if everything is urgent, where in the world do we go from there? How does anyone even operate successfully if that's the case? So with deadlines, we've got to be careful about, is this real? Is this a real deadline? I'm a certified mediator. I specialize in workplace conflict. I mediate dozens of workplace conflicts a year. There are so many mediations that come from a conflict around deadlines. Deadlines weren't clear. Deadlines didn't feel fair. Deadlines kept moving. I see it over and over and over again. So can we get clearer on what is a true deadline? The fifth one I want to talk about is priorities and workload. I am a word nerd. I love words and the meaning of words. And the word priority is from the 14th century. And it comes from the Latin word prior, which literally means the first. And it was that way for 500 years. For 500 years, the word priority was singular because there can only be one first. But then in the 1900s, we now started talking about priorities and it's plural. We can have more than one. I worked with an agency last year when they brought me in to do an offsite, they had 28 priorities. That's a lot and that's hard. And when I started talking to the team members, they weren't really sure what to do with 28 priorities. A priority is helping us know what's first. And if you've got 28 of them, then it's incredibly confusing. And the last thing I wanted to leave was other, because you may have a boundary that I haven't thought of. You might have a boundary that hasn't shown up in the research that I've done or the mediations that I facilitated. So give yourself some time to think about what boundaries do you need to put in place in order to achieve your desired work-life harmony. When you look at those two circles, if you were gonna get to that desired state, what are the boundaries that would have to be in place in order to help you do that? And when you're thinking about what gets in the way, I would encourage you to give yourself some reflection time to consider if you're getting in your own way. Are you getting in your own way of achieving your desired work-life harmony? For years, for me, the answer was yes. So much of that pressure of how I shared wherever I was, I didn't feel like it was enough. Whatever I was doing, I didn't feel like I was enough. So much of that pressure was from me. So many of those expectations were things that I had put on myself. I was getting in my own way of achieving what I wanted. And if you're doing that too, then let's not do that any longer. Don't wait as long as I did. Don't wait until you had to reflect decades later. Make changes today to ease some of those expectations, to ease some of that stress that's going to align you with your desired state. It's also worth considering if you're getting in other people's way, and you may very well be, Either intentionally or unintentionally, you may be behaving at work in a way that is keeping someone from their desired state of work-life harmony. If you're someone that emails at all 
night, you email all night, you email all weekend, and there's never been a conversation around expectations, you may very well be getting in their way of work-life harmony. So we've got to step back and have the conversations that will help us move forward. As we look at question three, I wanted to bring up some work from Stuart Friedman, who wrote a book. It's been 10 years ago now, but I think it has stood the test of time. And it's called Leading the Life You Want, Strategies for Integrating Work and Life. And what Friedman encourages us to do is that when we're thinking about our life, in particular, work-life harmony, to not think about our life as one big thing, but to think about our satisfaction levels in four different areas of our life. And the question that he would encourage us to ask ourselves is, what is the intended impact that I wanna have? What's the intended impact that I wanna have on this season of my life? And it may very well change. If you think back to that 1996 picture of me when I was a receptionist at DSHS, the intended impact that I wanted to have at work was very different than it would be decades later when I was an assistant director at l and In both of those roles, I cared tremendously about my job. I gave it everything that I had, but my intended impact was different. That's the question he's encouraging us to think about. Where do I want to create change? Where do I want to leave a lasting legacy in this particular season of my life? And what I also appreciate is that he tells us to not get too focused on aligning everything with purpose. And it's such an interesting way of thinking about it. If you're familiar with Elizabeth Gilbert, she's an author, and I saw Elizabeth Gilbert give a keynote where she was describing something that she called passion paralysis, where there's all of this pressure right now to know what your passion is. There's all of this pressure to know what your purpose is. And if you're doing anything outside of your passion or outside of your purpose, then it's a waste of time. And she tells the story of how she arrived in California to give a keynote address, and she had a few hours before she was due on stage. And so she just walked along the beach in Santa Monica. And she, she shared the story that she looks across the street, and there's an incredibly tall ladder, and there's a man standing on the top of the ladder painting a building. And so she gets this anxious, nervous, like, oh my gosh, is he going to fall off this ladder? So she crosses over to the street and she just quietly holds the ladder. She didn't say anything to him. She didn't introduce herself to him. She even said she's not sure if he even knew she was there. But she sat there holding the ladder until he started to come down the ladder. And then she walked on. And what I loved about her story is she was saying, maybe that was my purpose that day. Maybe. My purpose of showing up was to actually hold the ladder, not to give this keynote to the thousands of people that were waiting for waiting to hear from her. I think sometimes we do the same thing. Sometimes we are so stuck and so consumed by trying to figure out what is my passion? What is my purpose? Am I living into it every single second of my life that we almost make it harder for ourselves we make the desired state so convoluted and so confusing and so hard to attain that how in the world could we ever get it? How could we ever build something if we can't articulate what it is we're trying to build? So sometimes we just have to hold the ladder. The three questions are on page nine in your workbook. So I put them all together for you on page nine. And so what does work-life harmony mean in that season of your life. Try not to think too far ahead. It's always good to have a plan. Those of you who know me, I have a plan. My plans have plans. So <laughs> it's always good to be forward thinking. And allow yourself the freedom to really hone in on this particular season of your life. What will desired look like right now? Secondly, to consider what's getting in the way. Is it some of the things I mentioned in your workbook? Is it a boundary that you need that hasn't been put in place? Or maybe it's you. Maybe you're getting in your own way. 
And if that's true, then don't judge yourself for that. Have compassion for that. My gosh, okay, without even knowing it, I've been getting in my own way and I'm gonna do something different. And then the third question is, what is the intended impact? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And if you can hone in on that, see if that helps you describe your work-life harmony just a little bit clearer. We're just a few minutes from wrapping up. And so I wanted to leave you with this question. And it's, what is one thing you can do today to move you closer to your desired state? What is one thing you can do to move yourself closer? You don't have to have it all figured out today. You don't even have to have most of it figured out today. But just take a quiet moment of reflection and ask yourself, what is one thing that I can do today to move myself closer? And we've got Lauren who knows it's about grocery pickup. Tanya is going to leave on time. Whatever it is, do that thing. Sometimes they're big things and sometimes they're small things. And one of my most favorite memories of when I think I nailed work-life harmony, because let's be clear, I get it wrong a lot. <laughs> I get it wrong a lot, but one day I know I got it right. Our son, Miles, was in kindergarten and little sister had just been born and Miles was exhausted because sister was up crying. This was not the world that he had wanted. So I'm driving into kindergarten and I look in the rear view mirror and he's falling asleep. And so I drove right by kindergarten and we go to Starbucks. So there's five-year-old Miles in the back of the seat, kind of confused, like what's happening? And I said, buddy, we're taking a hooky day. And he was like, well, what's a hooky day? And of course his mom is a word nerd. So I had to describe that the word hooky comes from a Dutch game that means hide and seek. And I said, we're taking a hooky day. And for the next eight hours, Miles made the agenda. We looked at trains, we went to the bookstore, we went to lunch, we went to the park. Did it solve my entire motherhood land of guilt? Like, did I have everything figured out? No, but what it did do was in that day, it was just the two of us. Miles is now in college. We just visited him at WSU last weekend. And he literally said to me, do you remember that hooky day? Do I remember it? I'm talking about it in a keynote. Like, yes, I remember it. So all of that to say one thing, small or big, do it for you and for the people you love. Thank you for having me. If there's time, I'd love to take a few questions. Hey, Amy. Oh, that was amazing. Thank you for that. Thank we did you. have just a couple questions. I think, um, you know, most of that conversation in the chat was really what was going on, but we had just a couple. Um, one person in response to, you know, the talk about the emails and not working outside of hours, they said, if we send emails during the evenings without expectation for the person to respond until their work starts, is that okay? Or do we need to send during, let's say, your typical eight to five shift? I love this question because I have helped teams with that exact question. And I would recommend that you let the team help create the boundary because here's why. You can say, I'm sending this email at a time that works for me, but there's no expectation that you respond. Well, it kind of feels like there's an expectation. Sometimes it feels like even though someone says that, it means something different. Mm -hmm. I've worked in teams where the leader who was trying to not create that evening weekend email was using the send later feature. Have folks ever done that? So there the problem was though, now the team would come in on Monday morning to 30 messages that came in Monday at eight o'clock. Yeah. So what I suggested in that leader when we were doing coaching is that rather than just firing off an email every time we have a thought, which mm -hmm. is often what we do. Sometimes we use email as a, I'm gonna fire this off to catch this idea, was for them to keep a running list over the weekend instead. To, is this something that can be paired up with something else? If it's urgent, then by all means, fire it off. But those I'm just musing, I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering, those can be in a much different way than having 30 emails come in Monday. So bottom line, bring in the team and decide together because what work-life harmony looks like for one may look different for someone else. I love that question. What a good answer. And as you were talking, that just made me think that there was a job I had in the past where I would come in in the morning and I swear the supervisors sent me so many emails and you could see they started at like 
six o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I just started. I can't even breathe. Um, so that's really thoughtful. Thank you for that. Uh, I love that you just said that because I would assume that the leader was trying to do the right thing. Like, I'm not, I don't want to bother you over the weekend. I'm not going to bother you in the yeah. evening without realizing the impact was, wow, now Monday morning, you're feeling a huge amount of stress before the week even gets started. So that's where the open conversation, I think, can help a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. And then the other question this is a good thought provoking question. So they said, instead of, so this was sent earlier in the presentation, instead of burnout, which focuses on the workers' feelings, is it also important to discuss exploitation, which might focus on the need for structural solutions? 100% yes. Uh, and burnout isn't just about feelings. So the World Health Organization says that there are three different pieces of burnout. So we have to first be having a sense of overwhelm. So there's a belief that there isn't enough time in the day. No matter how much you do, no matter how hard you work, there's not going to be enough. So the first dimension, according to the World Health Organization, is a feeling of overwhelm. Mm. The second is that there's negativity or cynicism that you start to feel negative about your job. Maybe you're someone who really likes the work you do and you're always kind of the first to volunteer, but you catch yourself not feeling that way. Mm -hmm. Or you even catch yourself saying unkind things about work. That would be the second dimension. And then the third one is self-efficacy, where, where it doesn't feel like you've got the confidence. You start questioning yourself. You start doubting yourself. So it is in part about feelings. I agree with you. The World Health Organization would say, yes, there's a feeling of burnout, but it's connected to those three tangible, measurable dimensions that they lay out. And anytime we're talking about anything, I think we have to be talking about, is this inclusive? Is this equitable? Is this fair to everybody that we work with and work for? Yeah, great question. Wonderful breakdown. So when you break it down like that, then that really gives you the, that that direction to now talk about the structural solutions. So that's really good. Thank you for that breakdown. Yeah. Uh, as you were talking, we got another question. How can I be supportive to people who work for me who I see might be struggling with their work life? Oh, I love you, whoever just asked that question. <laughs> Because if every leader would ask the question that you just asked, imagine that. And so what I would recommend is ask them. Ask them, start the conversation. And you could even use this conference as a reason of why you're having the conversation now. I was just in a presentation today where the presenter talked about coming together as a team and talking about what work-life harmony meant to us and, and how can I be helpful. I was coaching a leader just a few weeks ago and they went on to ask the question, what am I doing that gets in the way of you? And wow, if you're open to the feedback of that, or even what's one thing I could do differently to make your life easier? What's one thing I could stop doing? However you want to phrase it, whatever feels natural and authentic to you, you're trying to get information. Work-life harmony is best when it's kind of like lean, when it's developed together, not when solutions are presented to someone, but solutions are created together. Thank you for asking that. I hope every leader on this call takes your example. That's awesome. And one more quick question with quick answer, and then I've got to do our outro, but how might you deal with a team leader who insists on a daily team meeting in parentheses, for a team who feels meetings, our time sucks. Yeah. Well, then it's about giving feedback, assuming that it is in a place where you can do that. So I believe that we should always be checking in and saying, is this meeting worthwhile? Are we getting out of this meeting what we need to? What is the purpose of it? And if 99% of the team is saying this isn't value added, then it's probably worth reconsidering. There are times where meetings are almost one-on-ones that everybody else is sitting in, and that's not a great use of time. So is there a way that we could be more efficient, more effective? And again, to not start from judgment. If you start with, your meetings are the worst, and I've been around a long time, that's probably not going to help. But what if you started with curiosity and said, you know, it's been a while that we've been doing these meetings. I would love to understand what do you get out of these? What's the what's the biggest thing you get out of these meetings? 
Then once you know what that is, what a win looks like, then you may be able to propose a solution that doesn't include an everyday meeting that most people find to be a time suck. So let go of the judgment, start with curiosity, and then see if you can design something together. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Amy, you're amazing. We appreciate Thank you. you. Thanks for this wonderful session. We also want to thank our ASL interpreter, Ashley Wagner, our cart captioner, Ashley Vishal. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for all your input. Such a good, engaging session. We're so happy to have you all with us today. There is absolutely more of the conference to come. So if you want to visit our website, results.wa.gov, you can revisit sessions you've watched live. Remember, we'll re be recorded. Uh, uh, posting that recording within a week. Um, you'll be able to watch sessions you might have missed after those sessions have been posted. You'll be able to download copies of presenter materials, sign up for additional sessions. So go check that list out if you haven't signed up for all of them. Um, and then you'll see a survey that's going to pop up pretty soon. So please, please, please take a moment to fill that out. We really want your feedback. We want to continuously improve and we need you to do that. Um, so we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you again for attending our session. Bye.